Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, uh, I've been having a great conversation with my friend Jeffrey Drum, the Land of Chem on YouTube, Instagram, and uh, this is Sage Silent here, and uh, on uh, YouTube, I'm at the Great Pyramid. Jeff and I just had a great conversation, and I just told him, Jeff, I forgot to record this, so we're, we're going to do a short little session here. We started recording, so Jeff and I have talked, uh, we, we did one session that, that uh, you can watch where we talked about the chemical production uh, in the Great Pyramid. What we talked about, and not just the Great Pyramid in all of Egypt, the pyramids all throughout Egypt, and uh, and then we talked uh, on this uh, before we recorded this about uh, some of our thoughts about ancient high uh, tech claims uh, in Egypt, and we talked a little bit right. more about the, the practical uh, production of, of of chemicals. So let, let Jeff, why don't we summarize for the people what we just talked about? What are uh, you know? Let me just make this a sync form. Chemical, you show that chemicals give a lot of evidence that there's evidence on, on in Egypt of this, the, the pyramids being uh, chemical plants of sorts, and they produced urea, uh, methane, and ammonia. What practically, how did that help Egypt, those products? How did it make it a, a higher higher level civilization? Yeah, absolutely. So starting with the usage of methane, right? Yeah. So there's evidence in the conventional historical record that the ancient Chinese were harvesting natural gas and transporting it in bamboo pipelines for just normal domestic applications, boiling water, um, lighting applications. I recently did an episode on my channel about methane lamps and how natural gas can be used for a very rudimentary lighting system. Sure. Again, very, very practical applications, but very, very useful applications for the benefit of a civilization. So sure. simple domestic applications. Sure. If you're doing so, you, can, you know, you, it's, it's, it's dark in your tent. You really want to finish something, but you can't. There's no light. Now you can do yeah. it. And absolutely. And there's a lot of questions that come up about why is there not all this torch staining inside of some of these ancient chambers? Right. Well, if you were using methane lamps, you can very, very easily light these underground structures and not be at risk of carbon monoxide poisoning because these are very effective ways to do safe lighting indoors. So again, very practical applications, but you can also use methane flame for metallurgy. So again, this is another application where you can have a very consistent temperature flame, which we've seen evidence in some of the dynastic Egyptian chemical operations. Again, we were talking about Egyptian blue, and I went on this big long spiel about the properties of Egyptian blue. So this is one chemical that we know was being produced by the dynastic Egyptian civilization on an industrial scale. And pigment manufacturing is ancient chemistry. And okay, Egyptian so let me, let me blue. Say, let, me yeah, just jump in, let me jump in and say something about Egyptian blue. So Egyptian blue is in, for instance, the ceiling of the pyramid of Unas, and yes. uh, and so that that you know there, that is a place I take my tourists because it's got that light show, you know, where it's got the pharaoh that you can see when a light is shined on in the dark, but then you you turn the lights in the room on, you can't see it. That's like this magic show you've got there. So the fact that they've got this. Egyptian blue, this special pigment that they make, which had, tell them some of the special properties of Egyptian blue. Right. And so that's a perfect example of how this Egyptian blue could have been implemented. So the Royal Society the, of Chemistry was, yeah. yeah, yeah. So the Royal Society of Chemistry has been attempting to replicate the production process for Egyptian blue. It's an incredibly difficult chemical to produce, 900 degrees Celsius vats, and it has to be made very, very consistently. So again, evidence of a large scale industrial manufacturing operation for producing chemicals, which is the basis of my theory. But they're also finding that the lattice structure of the Egyptian blue molecule has some very interesting properties and it makes it a fluorescent paint. So when you shine light on the paint, it will emit 100 times as many photons as it absorbs. So imagine these wow. fluorescent or these lights these glow-in-the-dark stickers that you used to yeah. stick on your ceiling as a kid, these yeah. glow lights. So you could have had that inside the Pyramid of Wanis where these glow lights were providing the lighting for this internal chamber wall, you know, the figure on the wall that only yeah. pops out in the light. Perhaps that was actually providing the lighting for that shadow figure to be seen. Yeah. So again, this is a functional property of this material that is somewhat disregarded in the narrative of dynastic Egyptian civilization. Yeah, yeah. They're also finding that the lattice structure of this molecule can be used for lithium ion batteries and making anodes. So it's a very functional 3D material that we're just now finding out has some incredible properties yeah. being produced by the dynastic Egyptians. Okay. So again, methane flame, we're doing domestic applications. 
we're doing metallurgy. But methane is also a synthesis gas for the production of other gases, specifically hydrogen, and for the manufacture of other chemicals. So in our modern day operation, we use methane gas as the synthesis gas for the beginning of ammonia production. And that is exactly what I'm proposing was happening in the series of Egyptian pyramids where methane was being produced at the step pyramid complex. And for example, so there's that silo, the big silo on the western side of the step pyramid that has all of these. It's basically a hallway that goes down the inside of the silo and there's chambers all the way down this long silo. And it's about the length of two football fields. Mm -hmm. And they say that this was a storage silo for agricultural material. Well, why do you need agricultural material at a pharaonic burial? Well, that agricultural material was being utilized in the slurry, which also included your cattle manure, to produce that methane gas. That methane gas could have then been transported to the uh, Red Pyramid, where it was transformed into ammonia. And the Red Pyramid was one of the primary structures that I focused on when I was developing this theory, mainly because of the intense smell of ammonia inside of the structure, the chemical staining on the internal walls, which I knew was an indication of a function of that structure. So when I got home from Egypt after my first trip, I sat down and tried to look at the functional architecture of the Red Pyramid because it has this converging tiered vault. Yeah. And I knew that the chemical staining got much, much darker in the upper portion of the chamber compared to the lower portions of the chamber. So again, I found this a very interesting feature that was an indication of the fluid dynamics inside of that structure. Because if you look at that staining, there's a pattern to that staining that there's flow dynamics on the lower portion of the chamber and there's fluid dynamics moving from the first chamber through the connecting shaft. So I started to reverse engineer the structure and look at basic physics. So again, we were talking about our disagreement with the lost ancient high technology narrative, right? There is simple, simple physics-based mechanisms and applications that you can look at that explain away this lost ancient high technology narrative. For example, that water wheel powered gear machine for cutting stones. Yeah. It's a very, very simple physics-based machine that could have been powered by water where one turn of your water wheel can produce hundreds of turns of your saw blade. And mm -hmm. we found that chemical analysis that proves that it was arsenical copper, a completely different type of metal which, with properties that are similar to steel. And they were using an iron and titanium microparticle slurry for cutting of stone. So again, mm -hmm. it does not require lost ancient high technology, mm -hmm. but it did involve the knowledge of chemistry and physics for practical applications. Okay, let me let me cut to the chase on, on this note. So now you've got ammonia being yes. from the methane gas. What what way is ammonia helping practically help the civilization to be a little bit higher level of standard of living? How does absolutely? It help? So again, this goes to our discussion in the previous segment where we were kind of pushing the timeline of dynastic Egyptian civilization back a few thousand years to incorporate the Saharan wet period which is a period from 8,500 BC to around 3,500 BC. And it co coincides with the beginning of the dynastic civilization around 3,500 BC. So during this time period, the civilization that once lived around the Nile River was spreading out into the upper eastern Sahara because there was plentiful rainfall during this period. And they were transforming what was a desert into an area that was primed for agricultural development. And ammonia and ammonia-based fertilizers would have been incredibly useful in terraforming this desert and transforming it into soil that could produce crops and mm -hmm. increasing the yield of your crops. So again, having these fertilizers is basically what led us into our modern industrial revolution and our ability to transform our modern civilization from what was in the early 19 or 1800s, early 1900s into what we have today. Yeah. Ammonia is still predominantly used. 90% of the ammonia that we make is used for fertilizer for the production of agriculture across the world. Yeah. So it's an incredibly important chemical for the civilization at large. And when I was developing this theory, I was looking for the justification for building these structures because it's a tremendous amount of money and a tremendous amount of effort, resources, et cetera, to build these things. So why would they go through all of this effort? I certainly understand 
the dynastic interpretation of pharaonic burial and the deification of that. I understand all that. But there is certainly some functionality in the architecture of these structures, which is an indication that they were mechanisms to do something. Yeah, I, I so think I, I always, you know, you know me, I always take the symbolic and the sacred first, but they, they were so practical. Why not cover, touch all bases? If we're going to, because one of the things that where they build it so big, they could, probably could have made, they probably could have designed a methane production that, that didn't require that big of a pyramid. They could have right. made some other kind of structure. But the Great Pyramid now and the other pyramids, they draw the attention of the whole world. It, it gathers people. That, so that alone, you know, the Eiffel Tower, you know, they, they, you probably saw that the best artists and architects in France put a petition out. That's the ugliest thing ever. Get it out of here. Yeah. That draws more people than any other monument in the world. So the attractive factor, that's one reason. Draw people there. So there, right. so, so chemistry, beauty, largeness, there's all symbolic numerical astronomic that you know there's so many purposes but you they were so if we're going to do this let's make it functional too and that's right. that's where i you know i, I see where what you're saying comes in so let, let me ask a, another question here because we've got we just have about four minutes here left jeff okay the red pyramid we talked a little bit about that tell the people about the what was found on the on the that covered the casing stones on the red pyramid and what you're looking forward to seeing next time you go yeah yeah so the acida project is an anonymous russian team that had taken some samples back in 2010. I've been in contact with the Acida Project, and they've given me the results of several chemical analyses. I have episodes on my YouTube channel that explain the full thing and show videos and photos of this material. But they discovered a coating compound that was covering the exterior casing stones of the Red Pyramid. Mm -hmm. And that was the reason that it was eventually called the Red Pyramid, because it appears that this is a red paint or a coating compound okay. that covered the entire structure. And they did a chemical analysis of this material, and it's an oligomer of sulfur and silicon that's infused with some metal microparticles. So it was basically a chemically resistant, self-repairing compound. So they did some tests on a modern, um, similar compound, and if you scratch the surface of it, and then you heat it, it will self-repair. So it's not only a chemically resistant compound, but it could have been a self-repairing sealing compound that was applied to the entire exterior of this structure. And it was also pretty probably because it was red. So it, Absolutely. Had, it had beauty, but also you're saying not just beauty, it seemed to be protecting what was going on inside the red pyramid. Why, why do Correct. you need a coating like that? Well, but make it last longer, make it, yep. and it's still a beautiful pyramid. It's a beautiful structure. The casing stones are off. Uh, why is it still red? Why does it still appear red now, even though the casing yeah. stones are off? What? So there's, there is iron oxide inside of the core stones of the red pyramid. Okay. And that is some of, so there's also chemical staining on the inside of the chambers of the red pyramid. There's extrusions of material that are being squeezed out of the stone. And we don't see this in very many, there's a little bit in the bent pyramid, a little bit in the satellite pyramid, but we don't see a lot of those extrusions in some of the other chambers. And the reason this material is extruding from the stone is due to the fluctuations of temperature and pressure inside of the chamber. So some of that reddish black material is iron oxide, and there's a lot of that in the core masonry of the Red Pyramid. So that's kind of why it's, it looks like that now. Okay. Okay, well, Jeff, when is your next trip to Egypt? So it's not quite ready to reveal yet. I have some pretty okay. major news that's coming up very, very soon, okay, but it's going to be very, very soon. Okay. Well, I, I'm going to be uh, a faculty on Robert Grant's tour, which uh, starts uh, February 25th and goes through March 7th. And then I've got a tour, the Pyramid Adventure, where I'm only doing pyramids. First time I've ever done that. And that's going to be March 8th through the 13th. So I'm I'm looking forward to that. And I'm going to have, uh, I'm going to be able to be in the Great Pyramid for about five hours. Uh, that's awesome one of those days so i'm gonna i hope to get a lot of research done there so i am revealing my, my i've history. still i've still never had a special permission into the great pyramid we've had special permissions to a lot of other sites yeah. but
but I, I've never been down in the subterranean chamber, for example, which, I mean, I'm, I'm chomping at the bit to get yeah. down in there because Listen, that's I, a, I want to talk to you about uh, s some of those other things, you know, the uh, Serapium, the Osiris shaft. So let's, let, let's yeah. talk oh, about yeah. those next time we talk. So ladies and gentlemen, Jeff Drum, the Land of Chem, get his book, follow him on YouTube. Uh, Thank you so much, Larry. He's an independent researcher like me. You know, you're going to get the real stuff from us. Thanks, Jeff. Absolutely, Larry. We'll talk to you soon. Okay.